Um, okay. And, uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our talk tonight and our speaker is somebody very special to the University of Aberdeen, Neil Curtis. He's the director and the head of museums and special collections and uh, and he's probably got four or five other titles as well. He's certainly an honorary senior lecturer. Um, but uh, uh, Neil seems to catch all the all the spare balls, as it were, of the university's um, heritage and uh, and collections, which uh, are quite major, to put it mildly, quite major. They are really significant. So it's a very responsible position. And Neil is going to talk this evening about two issues that have always in the news at the moment, but none more so than at the, during the present week, repatriation and interpretation. And there's a subtitle, Empire, Slavery and the University of Aberdeen's Collections. And Neil, if you just have a little pause before you start, we've got a group of people just joined as well. Give them a second or two to fire in. Okay, well, I think everyone's joined. If anybody except Neil, of course, isn't muted, please will you mute. And uh, over to you, Neil. Thank you very much. Yes, so the topic I'm talking about, yes, seems to be, you know, definitely in the news. And I find myself in the news as well, quite um, quite surprisingly, as a result of all of this. So what I want to do is to you know start with a sort of overview of um, the university's museum collections and some of the ways, in particular, empire and slavery have, have fed into that, um, and then think about how we're dealing with that legacy today, both in terms, as I've said in the title here, repatriation and interpretation as the sort of, you know, two big strands of that, but there's there's a lot more. Um, and hopefully I have time for, you know, questions and you will have questions for me at the end. So I'm going to dive straight in. I've got a presentation, so I'm going to um, see if I can share that. Is that working now? That should now be okay. Right. Um, so, let's see. Right. Um, so, thinking about the the history of the university's collections, I mean, I, I characterise them in some ways quite quite simply. There's a number of big headings that um, sit behind how things have been acquired. The first, most obvious one, in a sense, is treasure that the the university and its you know precursor colleges um, were and are significant institutions in the northeast of Scotland. And therefore, it's not surprising that they've been given precious things to memorialise people, that they have had a status that brings with it um, acquiring stuff. So um, these are just three examples that, um, you know, a silver cup given by Lord Struth Naver um, and a, a painting by um, Canaletto that was actually fairly recently identified as definitely by Canaletto. Um, and then in the middle, another silver item, a silver chain um, found in Nig Bay. And I, I was I was wondering whether in the, the building of New Harbour, anything else would have been found, but nothing seems to have been discovered. Um, so this, this middle object was actually probably a Pictish silver chain, or at least of that period, um, made as sort of regalia for um, a, a, a local ruler. Um, so that sort of, I think, obvious treasures that the, the university would acquire. And then particularly from the 19th century, obviously, um, the growing um, importance of science in, in how the university operated. So on the right, um, there's a demonstration model of how pulleys work um, used by Patrick Copland, who was um, pro um, professor in Marshall College. Um, two different, it's always amazing looking back how people are able to change disciplines and become professor in one thing and professor in, a, in another. Um, but then also some natural history specimens. And we actually have records dating right back into the, I think the 1720s is the, the earliest records of items being acquired for the museum. Um, and they were um, uh, bird, stuffed birds and uh, 
zoological specimens. Sadly, none of those early ones have survived. I mean, obviously, they're they're very vulnerable to decay, so they, they haven't survived. Um, and I think also some of the, the early museum collections were very strongly associated with an individual professor. So when they by the su successor. But we do have a continuous history from the 1780s of a museum in the university. So the university's museums are actually um, arguably the, the longest surviving museum collection in Scotland. Um, but so that growth of scientific collection was very important, often being acquired as part of teaching or as a result of research and then you know used for subsequent purposes. And then, of course, it um, was an institution of um, classical learning. You know, it used to be that um, people had to speak both Greek and Latin in order to be at university. And so classical antiquities were also very important. There were all the, the books that were in the library uh, of the Roman and Greek authors. But therefore, it was particularly important that they had um, original materials. So there's a, a very fine collection of um, ancient Greek silver coinage that was given to the collection. Um, also, as in this case, this is a, a, a Greek uh, drinking cup that was given by Alexander Henderson of Kaski Ben in the mid 19th century, along with a really quite important collection. We, it has now been published as you know a single volume of the Corpus Vosorum Antiquorum. It's a really important collection. And indeed, it was interesting doing that work on that by Elizabeth Maniard from Glasgow University. She was commenting that it was such a better collection than the Burrell collection, for example, because it was being acquired in the 19th century, as these things were being found, as they were being excavated in Italy, um, and this collector was acquiring them then and bringing them straight back to Aberdeen. So the collection today, um, you know, numbers, it's hard, it's hard to put a precise number on it. It's about a million items in total, which I'm responsible for, including the archives and the rare books, as well as all the scientific collections, the art collection, the historical and ethnographic ones. Um, but maybe of the order of about 80,000 museum items, uh, so a cultural museum items. The other strand that I think is really interesting, that all those previous ones you can see are quite prestigious items. But they then started acquiring things that really were in some ways not prestigious, not of the world of those people. They thought of themselves as classically educated. That was their intellectual history. Um, whereas things that I'm calling it exotic outsiders, um, things that were um, used locally, like the, the branks that was, um, you know, by the time it was collected, it had fallen out of use as a uh, as punishment. Um, this very elaborate set, it was fitted over the head of somebody being punished. And you can see the triangular piece towards the bottom that was a piece that moved into the mouth to um, make it very uncomfortable for somebody and certainly impossible to speak. So they were collected as, you know, local barbarity that was now no longer but brought into the collection. On the left, uh, a prehistoric beaker dating um, about 4,000 years old um, that was found and given by the same person. Professor Stewart gave both of those items. He was professor of Greek. So you, you see these links happening. And then um, the university has always had um, connections with the wider world, whether that be um, you know, fairly close, as in the Baltic, and the students from the Scots colony and, and then Danzig coming to study in King's College, um, or with the increasing connections around the world from the 18th century. Um, graduates of the colleges and the university travelled around the world and particularly from the later 19th century, the number of doctors who were trained in Scottish universities was really significant for the British Empire. Um, and this is, uh, th these items in the right um, may have been given to the university um, by somebody who again started, you're trained in, in, in Marshall College and was then the secretary to the Indian Affairs Commissioner for the Southern, uh, the Southern colonies, what's now the Southern states of the US. Um, these were probably collected from the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, uh, the Seminole. We don't know exactly which tribe um, in the 1760s. And these are quite important items because um, after the 1760s and 1830s, there was the um, Indian Removal Act when they were forcibly moved to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma. 
and very little survives from their culture from before that date. So these are quite an important survival, but they were acquired for the university as these examples of the exotic world. And just to move on to a couple of things that are not in the university collection, but I think are pertinent to thinking about the history of the Northeast. Um, in the 1580s, an English artist, John White, traveled to the colonies in North America and was famous for painting um, these portraits on the left of um, native people who he encountered. Um, he also painted a Pictish warrior. And much of our thinking about the Picts today actually still goes back to these painted people and that sort of imagination that was a combination of his experience of meeting people he considered to be primitive, and so he thought they were analogous with people he thought were primitive in the northeast of Scotland, and the classical writers, um, Julius Caesar, um, a, a, um, Tacitus, who had written about native people in the northeast of Scotland. And you can see actually the poses of them are almost classical poses. The, the man on the left is almost looks like a Greek or Roman sculpture. So that entangling of the classical interests and this meeting people from elsewhere in the world and a tendency to view those other people as primitive um, really feeds in a very complicated way into the way that um, the, the collections were formed and the way that people have understood the, the past. So by the turn of the 20th century, there had been college museums in most, both Marshall College and um, King's College, but they had been fused into one university in 1860. And following that, there were developments in Marshall College to, to create new teaching space, new research space for the sciences. The basically Marshall College is where science and medicine tended to be taught, whereas King's College is where it was arts and divinity and so on. And in the um, new building that was um, on the, these are both George Washington Wilson um, photographs and the, the university has the, the main collection of Washington Wilson photographs. On the right, this enormous white building dominating um, Aberdeen um, was opened with a royal opening in 1906. And the bit you can see in the picture on the right was what had been built in 1906, the frontage along Broad Street, um, the double height of the tower, um, and then the Mitchell Hall at the, the East End. However, in the bit of the building that had been created in 1837, there were two large galleries. One was the library and one was the, zoo, uh, one was the museum initially. And in 1906, the museum became focused on zoology. So the picture on the, on the left is actually of the museum as the Natural History Museum, the Zoology Museum of the university. Um, and the space that had been the college library that was a similar sized and looking place was converted to become the Anthropological Museum. And this was created by, and I'm going to show you some extracts from the catalogue that was published of it. Um, Robert Reed was Professor of Anatomy, and he viewed anatomy as one of the fields of anthropology as a broader study. So the physical anthropology, the study of the body, cultural anthropology, the study of culture, archaeology, the study of people in the past, and also sometimes philology, the study of language. But um, he therefore, when he created the Anthropological Museum, he really was meaning what we think of now as cultural anthropology and archaeology. He had another museum in the same building and metaphorically perfectly placed below, which was the Museum of Anatomy, the Museum of the Body, Physical Anthropology. And so he reorganised the collections that had been around the university in various places um, and created that anatomical museum and then upstairs the Anthropological Museum. And a few years later, he was able to publish a, a catalogue, a hardback bound catalogue, uh, which was on sale for a shilling. It costs a bit more now. Um, and this is it's a wonderful thing. It's got illustrations of a number of the items, which we still find very useful. It instantly, I think it's probably one of the first museums in Britain to have measured things in millimetres. And I think that's because he was an anatomist and that's the system. He called it the French system of measurement. Um, but he 
ordered the collection and he chose an order and you can see it here in the contents page that um it it starts with with europe and moves move, moves on to north africa then asia then polynesia then america australia melanesia which is places like particularly new guinea and fiji um, and then africa south of the sahara and that order was would have seemed very natural to him and to the people who were visiting the museum at the time. In a sense, it is you can imagine walking around the world in that route, going from Europe all the way around the world. Um, and that is indeed what the students who visited the museum would probably go on and do, that they were able to go as doctors and work in the British Empire. Um, and so they just as they did as students walking around the gallery looking in at these glass cases with things from these different parts of the world they would be able to travel around the world looking at these different colonies and indeed just as the objects couldn't move between cases or get out of the cases generally speaking the people in those colonies couldn't leave the colonies they had to stay where they were whereas um, the british people were able to to travel the other thing actually lying behind it is race and he was obviously very interested in race as an anatomist and um, in the anatomical museum the collection included a series of human skulls which were collected to show all the racial types and i noticed this is actually in you know it's just burbled up in the news um today you'll probably see things in the next couple of days that you know some journalists have, have noticed this which they've been you know it's been information has been available for a while but um and that you when you look at this you realize that basically the the first grouping where they tended to um think of the people of europe and the mediterranean um and into asia as the caucasoid races and then polynesia through to america uh well sort of eastern part of asia through to america were the mongoloid races and then they grouped the people from australia melanesia and africa as the negroid races so a three-part division of humanity by race and this ordering in the, in the catalog shows that so they'd have, they'd have been taught about race in the anatomical sense in one museum and then also learned about it culturally upstairs so that is what lies behind the, the the collection that we have and you know is is quite some legacy to deal with there's a it's an incredibly rich and fascinating and important collection but it has this history this is that's why it was created it wasn't created in the present um and so there are huge biases in the collection uh, i mean for example i a number of years ago wanted to do an exhibition about childhood and realized that I basically couldn't. I could do childhood in Albania in the 1920s and 30s because we had one collector who had worked there, Margaret Haslock, and as a woman, she probably was better at collecting things to do with children. Um, but most of the collections being put together by men had very, very, very little to do with children and childhood. Um, so although superficially it looks an incredibly comprehensive collection, there are huge gaps. Um, but anyway, moving on, um, I want to pick up just some of the individuals behind that sweeping story. And one of the very important ones is William McGregor, who was born as the um, son of a farm labourer in Towie in Western Aberdeenshire, um, did well in school and um, then came to Aberdeen Grammar School and then uh, the university um, to study medicine and he also I think went on to Edinburgh also and studied medicine there and he had um, an imperial career he started off as medical officer in um, in Aberdeenshire and then moved to the Seychelles became medical officer in Fiji and then became acting governor in Fiji and after that became uh, the first administrator of British New Guinea once uh, that was taken on as a as a colony. Um, after that, he was moved to Newfoundland, which now part of Canada was a separate colony. Um, after being in, oh, sorry, I made a mistake there. Sorry, before he went to Newfoundland, he went to Lagos in Nigeria, Newfoundland, and then ended up as um, governor of Queensland in Australia, almost back where he started. 
Um, I think he always felt a bit hard done by that he, I think he always had a Northeast accent. He always felt that he was never taken seriously by the British colonial establishment. He became, he was knighted, but he never was never ennobled. And I think that rankled with him that he, and he never got the top notch jobs in the empire. He was never, you know, governor general of Australia, uh, Canada and so on. So, um, but a very interesting man. And I think this quote from is quite important. Unless we know the people, we cannot sympathise with them. And unless we in some measure feel with them and for them, we can only rule by force. And that was his mantra as a colonial governor. Now, I think to us looking at that, on the one hand, a certain humanity comes through. At the same time, however, behind it all is that we can only rule by force. So that, you know, it wasn't. Um, an equal relationship. He was there in charge as governor. Um, but I think he was more sympathetic to some of the people who was ruling than some other governors. Um, he incidentally is featured as one of the um, collectors, as is Margaret Hasluck, who collected in um, in Albania. Both of them are in Provoskine's house. And I when you're visiting, do see how they've written about them. I think theirs is a very hagiographical account. I'm trying to give a more balanced picture of what he was like and how we might consider him. Um, <clears throat> we were very interested in him as a collector and he started collecting um, initially when he was in New Guinea and the picture on the right shows it doesn't include him, it's some of the people he was working with. Um, Baron Anatol von Hugel became the first um, curator of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Um, whereas, and he's one of the figures on the left. On the right is Arthur Gordon, who was the um, governor's private secretary and second cousin or something. There were a group of Scots in Fiji who were very dominant and they got the collecting bug, I think, from Anatol von Hugel. Um, and from then, he went on to collect wherever he was. And so he made a particularly important collection when he was in New Guinea. And some of that was given to um, Queensland, the museum there, with the injunction that when a national museum was set up in Papua New Guinea, it be returned. So he was actually, in that sense, repatriation is nothing new. He was planning that at the time. He also gave a collection to Aberdeen. So there's a couple of items there that were collected by him. Um, you know, the one on the left being while he was um, governor of, uh, of Lagos, that's now in Nigeria. Um, so looking at the collection today, there's so much that we don't know. And because sometimes the collectors, I mean, McGregor was quite good at giving some information, but frustratingly, he missed things. He didn't give us really rich stories about items. He would tend to say where it was collected and that was about it, but and a bit of information about what it was, but very, very little. So we've had a series of projects over the years, you know, we're nowhere near finished and we've taken a different area of the collection. We've worked with the university's herbarium, with the zoology museum, and we've been looking at the here, the cultural collections from North America is the most recent project that's just finished. And in this, we um, looked at um, the provenance records, the place names, and bearing in mind that some of the, the names were written down by people from Aberdeen who were hearing Inuit people speaking. Sometimes the transcriptions are really difficult to understand, but we've managed to work out what the places were and get the proper Indigenous names um, available for us. Um, this is a lovely item. It's uh, an argillite, um, so-called pipe, um, carved probably for the for the trade by Haida people who are um, in Haida Gwaii Islands, um, the northern British Columbia, and it depicts the steamship Beaver, which was the first steamship on the American Pacific coast. Um, you see, it's a, a paddle steamer, and the collector William Mitchell was uh, worked with Hudson's Bay Company and was actually mate on board the the Beaver for uh, for a short while. So he collected that and then bequeathed his collection to the university. So that project improved hugely the records we've got for the collection. We also um, rehoused everything in in new storage, so it's much better cared for. 
But we also put effort into trying to make contact with the people from whom these things were collected. So we're now in touch with the Haida. Um, we've let them have information about all the items we have in the in the collection that are relevant to them from the Canadian uh, Northwest Coast. And then I showed that beadwork. Um, we've been in touch with the particularly the Cherokee and the Chickasaw and to a lesser extent the Choctaw. We have actually lent this material for exhibition there for you know a, a year at a time. And their interest in it is partly it is historical material, but also some of these items and particularly the one that's on the right of the screen and there's close ups along the bottom is an am amazing item because it's an unfinished sash. It's a wool, wool, red woolen cloth with glass beads sewn on it. And this is really, really exceptional to, for somebody to be able to see one that is partway through being made, because the real interest in this comes from people who are trying to um, rejuvenate these traditional crafts. So to be able to see something in the process of being made has been very important. So they're not actually just now talking about repatriation. What they're talking about is, can they have really detailed photographs um, loans to different places because it's not a matter of just one tribe or one place. It's about people scattered over, um, you know, actually much of the world. We even have a member of staff in the university who I think is Chickasaw. Um, and um, so we're creating a website as part of that project that will give detailed photography and much more information. And then exhibitions that I showed the study skin from um, John James Audubon. Um, and he was a very important natural historian in, in North America. The equivalent of the RSPB is the Audubon Society. And he worked closely with William McGillivray, who was a professor of natural history in Aberdeen. And we had an exhibition marking an anniversary um, that was about how they had worked together to create this amazing book. You can see in just the middle of the case, this huge book, Birds of America. But some of the stories we were bringing out from that were um, not just about the artistry, but also, I mean, the passenger pigeons are now extinct. They were shot and Audubon shot birds in order to illustrate them. Um, he also collected um, like the bird study skin, but he also collected some of those um, human skulls that were for, for the, and ended up in the anatomy museum. Um, so it's quite, a, it's quite a complicated picture, one that we simultaneously are in awe of the paintings and quite unsettled by some of the things he did, but it's left us quite a legacy. So to quickly get on to the repatriation of the Benin bronze, this is the one that used to be in Aberdeen. But I think an important thing is to think of this as um, in its African story, that um, the kingdom of Benin is a long standing kingdom, very important, powerful kingdom in West Africa. You can see its location there on the map. Um, and <clears throat> by the 19th century and the European powers, first of all, having little trading colonies on the coast like Lagos, um, then started in the Treaty of Berlin, dividing Africa up into territories that they had sole rights over. And it was actually as much a negotiation between, it was, it was a negotiation between European powers. And so when the British went to Benin City to negotiate with the Oba, there was a bit of slippage between where they're negotiating um, a trade relationship giving Britain preference over Germany or France, because Germany ruled Cameroon just to the right and France ruled Dahomey just to the west. Um, and I think the Oba probably was agreeing to preferential trade with, with the British, but the British also saw it as him ceding territorial um, power. And this led to the creation of the colony uh, of, uh, of Nigeria today. Now, in 1897, um, there was um, a British force went to um, Benin City and they were initially told to go away because there was a, a ceremony happening um, and they were told to come back later. They continued and there was then, you know, a battle um, to defend Benin City from this force that was seen as invading. Um, and the few survivors of that went back and Britain then mounted a punitive expedition 
And I think the word punitive is quite revealing because you only punish people you have power over. So this was Britain saying, you were to behave in a particular way. We are now punishing you for having behaved badly. Um, and the punitive expedition saw the Oba and the photograph on the right, um, the, the king being sent into exile and direct rule being imposed by, by Britain. And then the, they found in the palace um, treasures of lots of, of ivory and metalwork. And you can see there's actually a metalwork, there's a, a, a snake on the roof there. Um, and so the individual people on that expedition, some of them took this and they called it loot. I mean, they, the word is, is theirs. Um, and a lot of it was then sold to pay the costs of the expedition. So that sort of sense of reparations. Um, however, many of those items then ended up um, on the art market, some of them ending up in museums. So this is um, a list of some of the collections. The upper part of the list are the largest collections in the world. You can see the, the biggest is the British Museum, the second largest in Berlin. Um, and then at the bottom, I've put the position in Scotland that there were 74 in the National Museum, 17 in Glasgow, and then one in the University of Aberdeen. Um, but there had been demands for this to be returned, you know, for a very long time. 1935, there was a formal request from the Oba who had, you know, his, this was a succeeding Oba who'd got back to a Benin city. Um, and interestingly, in the 1950s, while Nigeria was a British colony, there was a museum being set up and the British Museum um, deaccessioned, removed from its collection some that they regarded as duplicates. It's not something where museums tend to think now, tend to think everything is, is uniquely different. Um, and they were then sold um, for the National Museum in Nigeria. Um, in 1963, the British Museum Act um, changed the way in which the British Museum was governed. And one of the things it did was it got rid of so-called family trustees, the, the descendants of some of the early um, donors, sellers to the British Museum, like the Earl of Elgin, um, the descendants of those people continue to be trustees of the British Museum. Um, and also set up rules that um, things should no longer be deaccessioned, that the collection must be retained for the future. Um, so in 1977, there was a, a festival of arts and culture in, in Nigeria, and they chose as their symbol um, this brought this is actually a, a, um, an ivory um, figurine. And I wonder whether they chose it because it's quite a naturalistic one compared with the, the one I showed you that was in Aberdeen. And the British Museum rejected the loan request to have this on show. Um, I think their argument was that it was, um, you know, it wouldn't, the environmental conditions would be not good for, for ivory and there'd be a risk in it being damaged. But that rankled badly with people in Nigeria who felt this was a, such an important item that it should be the focus of this festival and it was being denied. And in the 1990s, Bernie Grant, who is a, a Labour MP in London, um, he led a campaign to return the Benin bronzes. And that included finding out from museums what there was. We have a letter in the, in the archive um, to the university where you know, the university said, yes, it had one. He also made a request to Glasgow Museums, which was in 1996 rejected. But that argument for returning all of these items that had been looted, you know, never went away. And by, the, um, by 2010, a number of museums that had large collections, the, the, those ones on my list, they got together because they recognized the pressure was growing and they decided to work together to offer on loan, not repatriation, but on loan, a certain number of these bronzes and it was going to be a rotating loan. So I think it's fair to think that was a, um, a reaction to stop repatriation. Um, but nothing actually happened. And there were more complaints. This was just seen as delaying tactics by people who didn't want to do anything.
And in 2014, Mark Walker, this man who had inherited a couple of Benin bronzes from his grandfather, um, who was actually in, I think, the photograph I showed you earlier, um, he personally took these two items to Nigeria, to Benin City, and gave them to the Oba. And this was the first time that any had been returned. There were other places that had them. So um, there was one bronze cockerel on display in Jesus College, Cambridge, and students protested that it shouldn't be there and the college took it off display, um, but didn't really know quite what to do. Likewise, Rhode Island um, School of Design, they decided to take it out of their museum collection, but they didn't really know who do you return it to. So the question that was facing us when we started thinking about it um, was, do you return it to the OBA? Do you return it to the Nigerian government? Do you return it to the Ni National Museums of Nigeria? Do you return it to, indeed, the state government, Edo State, that is approximately the area of the old kingdom of Benin? And we didn't know. However, we were able, and this was the, the breakthrough really, was that we managed to get in touch with somebody, Professor Bankali Sadipo, in Nigeria, um, you know, through an intermediary. It was, this was the difficult bit. And he was able to get in touch with all these people. And we said, if you can all agree, then we will be able to return. And so we had this formal request came from the federal government, but supported by the OBA the state government, the national museums. And that was really significant because there was no question that we were returning this to the right people. We did our own provenance research. We had a record, it, it was bought in 1957. So not by, a, not a donation, but a, a purchase. And amazingly in 1927, th there was an exhibition um, of Ben in bronzes. And you can see there's a kind of little photograph of it. There was a little casting flaw there which matches the one there so this is definitely it um so we were able to trace it back to this exhibition of material that had been looted um so we're sure this was a looted ben in bronze so those in a sense were two of the important issues because we have a, a procedure for considering repatriation and the most important one you know for this one was about the history was this one of the looted ones? Had it definitely been looted? So we were sure of that. But in every case, we've looked through these different criteria. Why does it matter to return it or to keep it? What will happen if you return it or if it stays in Aberdeen? Um, and then the middle one here, who is asking for it? Who's getting it? Are they the right people? So we set up a, um, an advisory group, which includes people from the university, but also included Bankale Sodipo as a representative of the people it was going to. Um, and that unanimously felt it was the right thing to do was to return as a stolen property. And we had the route way set. Um, so we made the announcement and that's when it really, I mean, we knew this was going to be a big story, but arguably it's the biggest story the university communications team have ever had to deal with. So the Channel 4 News crew flew to Aberdeen to, to interview me. Um, I was interviewed for on a panel discussion on an Al Jazeera program, uh, the stream, which I think were the best two, but there was everywhere. And when talking about it, the line we emphasised was that it was, we were dealing with the truth. The truth was it had been stolen and the right thing to do therefore was to return it. And there have been a lot of discussion in, you know, in the media about the rights and wrongs of it. And we felt this actually was a very simple thing. And I was really pleased that the times which could have been unsympathetic, the, the, lead, the Times leader said, you know, there is no reason not to repatriate treasures. And, you know, this decision by the university seems entirely fair and reasonable. So we really emphasised that was why we were doing it. Um, there are other ways you could read it that it was about decolonization and things like that but i i think it was more important we stuck close in our media presentation to the core of the issue 
there were a lot of responses. Um, I put some of these, it went really wild in social media. Um, I think the, we've got numbers like 49 million impressions, um, people reading it. It was huge numbers. Um, I think one of the, the, the rapper MC Hammer, he retweeted it and that got to millions of people. Um, and you can see that some of these comments are, you know, completely supportive of the line that we took. Some of them um, were saying, the ones in red, um, were much more negative. Um, and I realize actually I've got the colors wrong in some of these, but some people were saying that the Nigerian museums won't be able to look after it properly. And interesting, some of those comments were coming from Nigeria, but nonetheless, we felt that the, the logic and the morality of the decision was we're returning stolen property. And if you're doing that, the owner doesn't need to justify what they're going to do with it. If you have something stolen from you, you deserve it back. You don't need to prove to the thief that you'll look after it better. Um, and then there was a suspicion that, you know, I mean, actually, these two are like that, a belief that we wouldn't actually be returning the real one um but quite an interesting range of things but basically a very positive response um and so we had a, a ceremony in october 21 it was a restricted ceremony because we're only allowed 50 people because of covid in in the room at the same time and you can see it on the table there and the person on the left is uh, George Boyne, principal of the university, and the right is Prince uh, Eriotawa um, Agatisi, who is the brother of the, the Oba of Benin who had come to uh, accept it. We had the group of people who came, included the Deputy High Commissioner of Nigeria, the Director General of the National Museums, and the representative of the Oba. So they all came, um, and that was then handed over to them. And a few months later, because they decided to put in an export license application, it took a while for that to go through. But in the end, um, they were given an export license, which is interesting in terms of the politics of it, that the UK government issued an export license, which I think is significant. It was then, in February 2020, returned to Benin City. This is it here in front of the OBA. And this cockerel was the, the one returned from Jesus College, Cambridge. We worked very closely with Jesus College. And in fact, the route way that we'd worked out, the people that we made the contacts with, I gave that information to Jesus College and they were able to make the same contact. So it was done in the same way. And I have had since then a number of other institutions who have been in touch and we've been able to put them in touch with the right people. So um, Glasgow have also decided that they, they will be returning theirs. And just to round off with a few things about, I uh, mentioned slavery. Um, this is, I and I showed you a little silver chain that we collected, and the person who gave that was Jonathan Troop, um, who was another medical graduate of, uh, of Marshall College. And um, he went to Dominica, to the Caribbean, um, and he kept a journal with little illustrations in it. These are a couple of them, including a, a self-portrait. Um, and his journals are a really interesting, valuable record of what was happening in the Caribbean at the time and, and what slavery was like. And while I, was, I used to think of Jonathan Troop very warmly with the silver chain that he gave, I recently came across this, uh, this comment that on um, 26th of March, 1791, Jonathan Troop wrote in his diary that his African lover, Nancy, was pregnant with his child. I had to close with her, he noted, and sailed for Europe that day. I feel not particularly warm to him. Um, but, and then another one I showed you, the uh, Canaletto painting and that uh, Greek Kylix um, that were given by Alexander Henderson. Um, and the painting, the picture in the middle is John Gash, who authenticated the painting as being a, a Canletto. And so we had an exhibition which told the story of that authentication, that art history, the connoisseurship. But it also told the story of how Alexander Henderson was wealthy enough to buy a Canletto. And that was because his father owned a plantation and enslaved people in the West Indies. So his wealth came from slavery. And this this Kylix, unfortunately, the photographs are the wrong way around, but you can just see there some feet. And this shows 
um, Greek people sitting having around drinking, having a symposium, their possessions at their feet, which includes a pots and a stool and, and their shoes. It also includes um, an African boy um, enslaved. And so I think to Henderson, I think that pot had quite a lot of complex meanings for him. So the legacies we have are really rich and tangled and complicated and difficult. And one of the highest profile items is the Powys Gateway, um, which is the most obvious site in Aberdeen associated with slavery. And last year we were able to get a plaque put on it um, as one of the city council plaques, um, which which says Powys Gateway was built in the early 1830s by the Leslie family using profits from slavery. The Leslies, the lairds of nearby Powys House, owned an estate in Jamaica in which they forced enslaved African people to work. After the 1833 Act for the Abolition of Slavery, the Leslies received government compensation, which also helped fund the gateway. The formerly enslaved people received nothing for their years of unpaid labour and suffering. That's a City of Aberdeen plaque. Um, the gateway was built in 1834. Um, so it clearly was that compensation money from the government. Um, so we've interpreted it with that plaque. We are hoping um, in the next couple of months to put up a larger interpretation panel that gives a richer, fuller story. So I'm giving you here a quick glimpse of what a draft is like. So we'll be looking at um, what happened in Jamaica, the enslavers, the enslaved compensation, and tell something of that story in the way that in the 70 words of a, of a city council plaque, you can't say much. And we're also, this is my final slide, we'll be opening an exhibition on the 27th of March this year in the Sir Duncan Rice Library. So you're seeing, you know, one of the, the first glimpses of a, of a view of the exhibition, um, which um, will tell the, some of that story um, of the legacy of slavery in the university, in Aberdeen and in Northeast Scotland, um, including um, the people who fought against it, the people you know who uh, argued for abolition um, and the, the legacy today. So um, I've got on the screen a picture of um, James Beatty, the moral philosopher who wrote against um, um, slavery and was pro-abolition. Also a portrait of Gilbert Ramsay, who was a very important donor to Marshall College in the late 17th century, gave thousands of pounds, which if you think what thousands of pounds then was today, um, from plantations in the Caribbean. He then went on to give very generously to poor people in the northeast of Scotland. So it's a really interesting, complicated business, you know, taking from one and giving to the other. Um, Manilas on the bottom right, which were um, used for trade, they were actually made in England and then taken and traded there. And some of the Benin bronzes probably actually have some of the metal from these Manilas in them. The one from Aberdeen was 18th century, so a bit earlier. And then an amazing coin, a Barbados penny, which shows an African boy's head um, it crowned and the words I serve beneath it and the three, the Prince of Wales feathers coming out of the top, which is in some ways, I think, rather a sick joke about being enslaved and serving. And it's a very strange coin, but we do have one in the collection. So what, as I said at the beginning, you know, the title of the, the talk, you know, repatriation is one thing, but that's about the collection, but it's also about interpretation, about the stories we tell and who we work with today to tell those stories, whose voices should we be hearing and what, what you know, what we should what we should do with that legacy. I think that's what I feel is my responsibility is dealing with the legacy today. That's what I've got to do. So thank you. And I shall stop sharing. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, <clears throat> if people have questions, if they would like to um, let us know, and if maybe if I go to the gallery, I will spot uh, spot you all. Um, who knows? Uh, but you can use the raise hand, the reactions as well, or you could put a question in the chat. You could do that as well. So, let's see, is anybody 
indicated that they would like to ask a question or raise a point or ask for clarification on something. Yes, I can see Margaret. Okay. Hello. Hello, thank you Hello. very much indeed. Good to see you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here and I must apologize for joining a little late. I hope I didn't halt the beginning of the, the proceedings. It took me a little longer than I anticipated to join. But uh, it's lovely to be with so many friends here tonight and meetings of the Saltire Society are very often like that for me. I've been a member in Edinburgh and, and in Glasgow over the course of my life in Scotland. Uh, but I wanted to, to uh, begin with uh, many thanks, which I'm sure are going to be coming Neil's way uh, from um, those of us lucky enough to hear him tonight. Uh, a, a, such a, a rich and insightful presentation and um, uh, wonderful to hear this, the backstory and, and also the way in which you have uh, worked to achieve what you, you have done in terms of repatriation and, and also in illuminating uh, the the subject of of uh, our contacts uh, with other parts of the world through the exhibitions that that you've had and and the one that is is coming up. I'm also reminded very forcefully of the fact that I have uh, still an Inuit print which I promised uh, to <laughs> donate to your collections, and I hope you still wish to have. That handover was uh, delayed by the pandemic, <laughs> but it is still uh, uh, still to be yours and the University of Thank Aberdeen, you. if you wish. Uh, I know all about the provenance. It was actually purchased in an exhibition of um, contemporary artwork from the north of, of uh, Canada, uh, um, uh, area now, now known to us as Nunavut. Uh, and uh, an artist, Inuit artist cooperative there. But the subject uh, shows uh, uh, dancers, it's called Whaler's Reel, and uh, it depicts uh, a meeting between Inuit and I like to think um, uh, whalers from the Northeast of Scotland uh, who made their way to the Arctic and. Uh, became part of the story, the story there. So I promise to make sure that you receive it this year, <laughs> if you wish to to uh, uh, continue with that as a as a gift, as a donation. And um, uh, it would be lovely if I can to come and see the exhibition on slavery, which you're opening next month, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, have have the handover at the same mm -hmm. time. Thank you. Thank you again and very much. <laughs> the exhibition incidentally will be open from the 27th mm. of March mm. until the 2nd of December. Mm. We're wanting this to be you know, is, a, is a big topic and so we're having it up yes. longer than we usually would and mm. there'll be a whole series of events associated with it. So, you know, I do hope I'll meet, meet some of the people here in reality and Margaret will be del mm. delighted to see you and even more <laughs> delighted to get the print. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, it's been a little while in... in yes. uh, uh, Thank you. Taking its time to get get from the south of Scotland to the northeast. Um, Kathy's put a question in the chat, Neil. Yes, Kathy wants to speak, yeah. but asks about the item mm. in Benin itself. What has happened? Yeah. I mean, I can say in in absolute honesty, I don't know because I've not been there. Um, what I did see the the last photograph I showed you with the the, the ceremony in Benin City um, is still available online. And you can see it being presented to the Oba. And then at the end, it's processed through the Oba's palace to what seems to be the, the Oba's museum. There's a building where, I mean, he has, this is not the only one that he has. There already were a number in the collection there. So they're in this palace museum. Um, but in terms of whether they're available to the public is a, is a different question. I've, I really don't know what access to the palace is like. I suspect very restricted. Um, but the, there's a lot of planning going on now about a variety of different museums. So there's um, a museum associated with the palace, and then there's also a branch of the National Museums 
in Benin City. Um, and there's indeed talk of a, of another uh, organisation, the Legacy Restoration Trust, who are wanting to get pu- private funding to build a large, a large museum. museum. So the intention is that there will be, I think they'd like the world's best collection to be in Benin City and available to see. I think one of the hopes is that it actually will help develop a tourism industry for Benin City. Um, with the Aberdeen one, we have returned it straightforward. Um, with some of the other collections, I think what's happening is that ownership will be transferred, but they'll then a number of them will then be lent back. So, so there will be ones on display not in Nigeria, but in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Oxford, wherever, um, that they're very keen to see these seen around the world but to feel that ownership and decision-making lies in Nigeria um, rather than in those museums that had them as a result of loot. So, Thank you, Neil. Um, Ian Brown, question, Ian. Yes, I was very taken by the Jamaican penny mm. when you were saying how curious it was. So you have the Prince of Wales Fellows mm. and you have the motto on his serve, which is a translation of the 15. Prince of Wales 18. What's going on there? Is it some kind of mm. mockery of the slave? Is it? That's what, uh, I, I, can you unpack it for me? I, I can't really. I mean, my feeling is mockery is in there. It doesn't feel comfortable. Mm. Um, and joking about a slave being, you know, serving that is there. They are born to serve. It. I don't know, but yeah. I have the same sort of feeling of you know, real disquiet about it. Yeah. Um, so I don't know whether we will actually manage to have that in display in the in the exhibition. We're quite restricted in what we're showing, but we will, if it's not in display, it will be used in some of the events um, as a discussion piece because exactly there's so much there. Um, it was alerted to me because there was one on display in um, Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. Mm. Um, and they had uh, a project which has been doing a bit of reinterpretation. There's now an additional label beside it, which raises these issues that the original label just said it was a penny from Barbados. It was a pretty bland label. Um, and the addition um, has really given up this, has, you know, made it much more troubled. Um, and does, it, does it have a date? Um, yes, it does, and I can't remember what it is. It's on the other side, and my photograph doesn't have the other side. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, it is dated. I mean, I think if you if you Google Bar- Barbados Penny, you'll find quite a few of them. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Dennis Smith has put something in the chat. If, uh, mm. I don't know if Dennis wants to make further comment, but anyway, yeah. I. I do feel there's there's it obviously was thought of as clever. And I think it actually goes back to um, the um, those classically ed- educated gentlemen building the collections, and that you know the the Latin mm-hmm. wit that they're displaying in that is coming through um, at the same time as I'd say in humanity. Yeah. Um, Neil, I'm going to ask a question now. Uh, it's uh, not intended to be too pejorative, but uh, there's a, a bit of a hint in that. Uh, is there anything in the university's collections that for you is a cause of shame, um, for you may be a priority to get it repatriated? I've actually been thinking about this out quite a bit today, that um, I find that that shame, guilt and so on is difficult because I certainly feel, you know, utterly out of sympathy with some of the people who did these things in the past. But, you know, personally, I am not them. And so I feel that, you know, shame would come to me if I didn't do things today. That is the legacy I've been given that I've got to work with. So I tend, I'm wary of getting into thinking about shame and guilt for me personally, but there would be if I did nothing. Um, I, The more that we look at the collection, the more we discover the complexity of it. And I mean, there are a number of items which clearly were, um, were taken a, as loot um, by force that, um, you know, quite reprehensible. So 
Um, what we're doing is trying to find what they are. We're hoping to be able to make an appointment of somebody who will take on this task of do because it's a huge amount of work of research to find what these items are and then to make connections. So um, I don't want to go into details because I, I don't feel it's appropriate, but there are a couple of um, Native American tribes that we're working with just now. And I, you know, so I don't want to name them because it's this is up to them this is their story um where we have um, ancestral remains that you know clearly relate to them and we're discussing with them about returning and i think this is one of the bits that i'm concerned that museums and you know those of us in the west um are liable to do is to feel guilty and want to do something to make ourselves feel better and that's the wrong motivation. We've got to be thinking of what these other people, what they want and work with them and respond to that. And I, I am concerned that, you know, some of the actions and some of the louder shouty words, I suspect are coming from people who they'll feel a lot better for having done it. But sometimes, I mean, like, I'm thinking particularly here, ancestral remains, to turn around to somebody and say, I've got your ancestor, take them back, could be really distressing. And they may not actually want to do it now. Doesn't mean they might not in the future. So with these North American ones, there's, I mean, I, I've got contacts with people who've got contacts with people. So we've put the information on our database. It's all up there. So if people are looking, they can find. And then when I'm able to find a contact, let people know, and then enable them to get in touch with us. Um, looking back at, I mean, I showed the procedure and you may have noticed in it, it talked about, it used the word claimant. And that's the procedure we have just now. It's something I want to change um, because the word claimant is not quite right. You claim from a position of less power to somebody of power. Um, and so the what I'm hoping to use is the word um, is about proposal. And I'd like as whether it is in the case of the Ben and Bronze, the proposal actually started with the university. So who can make that proposal isn't just somebody claiming their things back. It can from, come from another source and we need to discuss that proposal. But it really, this is about listening. And that's, you know, there wasn't enough listening in the past. And I don't want it to turn into almost a sort of neo-colonial thing where we now decide we've got to give all this stuff back, whether you want it or not. So it's difficult, but I think, you know, I don't think it's as simple as as shame and guilt, but it's a big, big job. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, David's got his hand up. David. Yes, just just a, an offer, if you like. Um, I'm a trustee of a relatively new Nigerian charity, actually founded in England by an old friend of mine who is Nigerian and has worked a lot in Scotland and in south of the border too. He now lives in Eastbourne. Mm. But he set up this charity uh, to do mainly um, social work in Nigeria. Um, but um, because of his connections, if there's anything I can do mm. to assist in this, please just do get in mm. touch. Yeah, and I think, thank you. Um, we, we've we obviously returned the one Ben in bronze that was loose in 1897. Um, there are actually a couple, we do have two others, um, one of which, slightly embarrassingly, we discovered after having returned the first one, it was um, catalogued as from the Chieftain's Kraal, which didn't lodge immediately that that meant the Oba's Palace. So it took a while to, to find out, but we've let people know about it. They know, but they've got other priorities around the world just now. Um, and then another one that was purchased in the 1950s and is a really nasty piece. It's um, disintegrating in, you know, in front of your eyes. And we did talk about returning that and, you know, they decided not to. And I felt, and I suggested that they, you know, we offered it, but I said, I don't think you should because the logic is wrong. This is the logic is about retrieving the loot 
rather than just retrieving anything. Now, I do know that the um, the Church of England actually returned two that were post-1897 ones. And I'm, you know, fair dues if they want rid of them, but that felt to me to be muddling the story. And I think the morality of it was complicated. Returning to what you were saying, however, is I flagged up um, um, Sir William McGregor as having been governor of Lagos and seems to be reasonably well regarded. He, uh, There is a McGregor canal in Lagos that's largely abandoned now that he used to drain a swamp and he, he produced a chart showing how, um, how malaria had declined during his tenure as governor. Um, but we have material he collected in the Lagos area. And I would like to be able to build connections with that. I suspect that um, it was seeing the way he worked. I don't think he looted it. I don't think it was stolen, but it might still be the case that there are people there now who would at the very least like to know more about it, might want to discuss, you know, return, exhibition, whatever. So, it might be if we were able to get in, you know, a, you know, through your offices, a way of getting in touch with people um, in the Lagos area about William McGregor. That would be very interesting. There is, there are other collections, and indeed, something I didn't mention. I mentioned the North American project. The current project we're working on is indeed looking at the African collections um, in the same way, but we're doing this as a partnership with the National Museums, with Glasgow Museums. Glasgow University and ourselves were leading a national review to try to find what is in all Scottish museums as the basis for further further thinking and further work. So I think there will be ways that we we can work on that. It would be great to keep you in touch. So drop me an email. Okay, will do. <laughs> oh, the other thing is completely different. My family has close connections with Aberdeen, Aberdeen University. We actually come from Keith. Uh, and um, but my grandfather spent his entire working life in Malaya and his brother uh, was a medic doctor who trained at Aberdeen University in Thailand. Yeah. Uh, and that was back in the uh, 19th century <laughs> and yep. the early 20th century. Uh, so if again, if there are any mm. links to Malaysia. Um, and yeah. indeed, Thailand, um, one of the collections we have is the herbarium. And we have a particularly important collection of Thai flora um, I believe it's the largest collection outside Thailand. Right. So there's, and I don't know whether there was a, 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 an Aberdeen medic, but it's possible. But I, it's, it is astonishing the connections that Aberdeen has with the rest of the world. Indeed. Mm. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. Well, Neil, I think we're going to wind things up now. We've had a really productive meeting and your lecture has been excellent and the responses i'm very grateful that you've had the opportunity to to um well to spell out one or two things mm. some nice comments coming up as well to say how much people have enjoyed Thank you. it's been very special indeed can i ask everybody who um is speedy on the unmute to give neil a round of applause please Okay. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you. Clapping hands even if we couldn't hear them. Yes. Great. Um, and thank you again. Now, um, our next meeting is the in-person meeting when we visit Provost Skeen's house on Wednesday the 22nd of March. And then the April meeting is on the 27th, the Thursday evening, and it will be a virtual one on Zoom as, for, as tonight has been with our city archivist, Phil Astley. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, there are lots more comments. Thank you. I enjoyed this fascinating talk. I'm looking at the exhibition, hoping I'm off for April. Uh, uh, we've had three, at least three people from the US, Neil. One of them, Dwan, said thank you. She fitted it. Uh, thank you, Neil, for a fascinating presentation. Um, yeah. There's some really nice comments coming up. Okay, thank you. The exhibition, incidentally, we there is already um, 
a virtual exhibition around the topic of um, historic slavery and the Northeast that was originally created in 2003, we probably will end up with a virtual version of the current exhibition also being put on our, our website, but not quite. We're focusing on the real one to start with. Yeah, I think people Thank have you. found out mm -hmm. the strength and the power of virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. As long as they don't happen four times a day. Yes, I know. <laughs> okay. All Thank right. you very much. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night. I'm going Thank to you. Close down in about 30 seconds. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And you, Ian, you did have a question, I thought. <laughs> did I miss one? You were going to ask me a question. <laughs> Oh, a private one, yes. A private oh, okay. one. Okay. Hang on a minute, David. Uh, uh, full screen. Full screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll hang on. And 10 green bottles have fallen. <laughs> well, my bottle's going to fall then, so thank you. Good okay. night. Neil, bye -bye. I think you've earned yourself a bottle. You've got to open and wrap <laughs> nice Thank one. you. Bye bye. Interesting. Right. If if everyone but David could sign off, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Carol, Carol. Yeah. Night, Carl. If you wouldn't mind. I'm sign. trying to come out. Yes. If you need the red mm -hmm. rectangle at the bottom somewhere, mm -hmm. where it says end. Mm -hmm. and Elizabeth and. Uh, Oslem, I think I'm going to eject you in a minute. Sorry about that. Nothing personal. I think I've come out now, have I? Hopefully. No, else we could hit. We can't hear you. We can still hear you, Carl. Oh, sorry. Yes, too, oh, right. We can still see you. <laughs> right. Uh, I just shut the whole thing down. So I, uh, I, got, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a pickle. Okay, don't worry. You're gone. You've gone because I ejected him. Right? <laughs> the power. Just of... Elizabeth, I'm putting you out. Sorry about this. Okay. And uh, Jindal, as well, I'm going to ask you and politely ask you to go. I won't make you a co host. I think Jindal must be out of the room. <laughs> yes, I think they are. I think they've, uh, they would, I'm sure they would respond otherwise. Well, I have attempted to remove them. And now it's asking me, would I like to <laughs> report them? Oh dear, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't. Well, hey. Hey. Yeah. well done. Right. Okay. Now, um, one of our members who uh, died. Look, look, looking behind you to interrupt, I, I do play the guitar as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see it. <laughs> it's not often I have it out. It's. Um, it's uh, just I uh, these days I use it more as a um, as a, a machine. I use it to to work out things rather than to actually play. Uh, but anyway, now um, somebody who is a member of the Sawtar Society died a little while ago, and they let it be known that they would like to make a donation to the society, but to the northeast branch of the society. All right. Now, is that a problem at all in any way? Well, <laughs> in my opinion, it isn't. Um, in fact, it's almost the reverse of a problem because we are aware that our branches need additional funding. The cost of living is rising, as it were. And we have been discussing that in, uh, I think we discussed it in council the other day, although I was trying to check the minutes before this talk and uh, couldn't actually find them. Um, 
is it possible for you to drop me an email so that I can discuss it with one or two people? Um, yeah, it's it's not um, it's not uh, um, at the moment. They've asked me to keep it confidential and not to mention names or an amount. Well, no names, no pack drill. That's fine. But in, in principle, um, I would like to actually discuss it with them. Um, well, actually, funny enough, Ian Brown is the constitutional expert, and he, he's we, we've dropped him off the screen. <laughs> I didn't eject in, I can assure you. <laughs> but he really is very, very good at um, these things. Okay, well. He's the one who's doing it all for the executive committee and the council. All right. Well, I, I will I will uh, send through an email, David. And uh, as I say, I don't don't want to create a fuss. I just don't want to contribute no. any bylaws or anything. No, well, in my opinion, it's fine. But um, although I've been treasurer and trustee for a few years now, um, the amount of constitutional work we do is just unbelievable. <laughs> and we do need to get a second opinion from Ian, I think, in particular. Susan Garnsworthy is the um, convener now, but um, I think, um, again, I would swing it in Ian's direction. But send it to me and I will have a word with him. Yeah, OK. Well, if you would... On a no-names basis. Sure. Yeah. OK. I could even limit it to one of the branches has had. <laughs> I don't even have to name Aberdeen. Well, it's, it just had uh, some of the committee may be very annoyed if we don't receive any funding in future. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. As a result of it. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. you, you've gathered the close connections my family have with Aberdeenshire and uh, Bamshire and yeah. all the rest of it. Uh, I'm looking forward to coming up sometime again. But I don't think I'll make it up for the live talk yet. <laughs> no, but don't worry about it. Anyway, um, it would be uh, yeah, lovely to make uh, a proper acquaintance. Let's just put it this way. In your, I, I visited my grandfather's grave in Keith on Hogmanay because mm -hmm. I was up at Newton Moor, and I visited my wife's family graveyard in Mortlach, Dufftown. Okay. On Hogmanay, we did them both just paying our respects to the family. So there you are. The connections are still ongoing. Two of my children went to Aberdeen University, two of my nieces and one of my nephew. So there we are. Yeah. Five of my children's generation. My I'm, father went to... I went Marshall. to St Andrews, sorry. My, my father went to Marshall uh, oh. and he was a, a medic and um, he was the first person in his family that went to university or went on to any higher education. Mm. And, um, he, uh, his family were tinsmiths. Right. Uh, yeah. So my, uh, my grandfather's brother was Dr. Thomas Ogilvy, and mm. he's also got published poetry. Okay. And he's the one who worked in Thailand. Um, he set up practice up in Orkney as well on Hoy, and uh, he set up practice in Birmingham and in Aberdeen over the water. What's the um, famous part of Aberdeen, which is over the over oh. on the other side of the river? Torrey. Yeah, Torrey. He and there's been a book written about him. So Dr. Thomas Ogilvy has a lot of interesting stuff about him. Oh, well, my grandfather lived in Torrey, and uh, and he he had a. Um, Quite a claim to fame in the northeast because he ran Aberdeen Football Club for nine years. Ah, ah, there you go. Well, then, he probably knew Dr. Thomas, who had his medical he practice. Paid into. them any money at all, and and uh, uh, they didn't even. Well, they didn't call them managers; they called them trainers. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, as I say, Dr. Thomas, he actually set up his practice in Torrey because they were deprived in Torrey of medical support. And he, he was became a very well known local me medical practitioner before moving on. <laughs> okay. All right, David. I'll be in touch anyway. Cheers, then. Right there. Bye All now. Right. Bye. Whoops.